I would like to introduce John Nicolopoulos, partner and national retail and restaurant sector leader for RSM, a national consulting and accounting firm. Today, we are going to get his take on what is happening out there in the franchise sector. John, welcome. Great Thank to have you. you here. It's great to be great here. Day. Thanks very much. Um, since COVID and the pandemic, how have you seen brands transform, franchise brands transform? Well, you know, it really depends on how they came through COVID, right? Um, and the degree of change they've need, needed to made, make. In general, some companies did very well. Those with digital platforms uh, did much better than those without. They didn't really need to change much. In the restaurant space, certainly a strong off-premise platform in addition to the digital platform was, was, was very good. And in fact, they, they thrived during the pandemic. So those that didn't have the digital platform and didn't have the off-premise platform uh, definitely needed to start moving towards that. So right now, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing an investment in technology, but it depends on where people are at. If they already have those platforms in place, it's going to the next phase. It's looking at things like data analytics and, and trying to streamline operations and, and dealing with automation to make things more efficient. If they're still in the survival mode, there's a lot more around customer engagement and mobile ordering, all types of mobile apps, QR codes and things like that. So it really depends where the company was in, you know, through COVID, entering COVID and as they exited COVID, how much change they needed to make. Now you were telling me before that customers and employees are both expecting something different from restaurants. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, COVID, in many ways was the great accelerator for both retailers and restaurant operators, right? We already had seen a move, a, a dramatic move towards online sales in the traditional retail space. We started to see more around food on demand uh, and, and the convenience of, of, of fast casual and, and, and food on demand in general in the restaurant space. And with COVID, we, we saw it really accelerate. Uh, with the shutdowns or partial shutdowns, people came to expect curbside pickup, whether it was at the grocery store or whether it was at the local restaurant or whether it was at a retailer. They liked the idea of somebody bringing it out, being able to order on their mobile device, but having the convenience of somebody to bring it to their car or, or delivery. So the question becomes, how much of that sticks going forward? I know as a restaurant, uh, a restaurant patron, I can't wait to get back out there and be waited on and have somebody pour me a nice glass of wine and have conversation with the wait staff and the people at my table, of course. I can't wait for that to happen. Um, but by the same token, I think a lot of us have become very, very comfortable with using the mobile device to order and get real food at home. And I say real food and that, I didn't, it, that sounds a little derogatory, but I mean a full meal. You know, we traditionally expected to get pizza and sandwiches via delivery and, and via pickup. I think what we've learned over the course of the past year that we can get a complete meal um, at, with curbside or delivery. And so I think our expectations have changed dramatically. And certainly the labor issue that we're facing right now is going to make it very, very difficult to get full, full bore back on prem uh, for, for the restaurant operators, at least in the near term. You said labor and funding are the two biggest issues right now. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that, you know, I, I think the coffers are empty for a lot of operators. They, 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 you know, they limped by over the past year and uh, to their credit, they cut where they needed to cut. They modified their operation where they needed to modify. Certainly the government programs help, but they didn't come, they didn't come away, you know, flush with cash in, in most cases. Some did very well and they are flush with cash, but for the most part, that's not the case. So funding is still an important part of of what people need to be able to, to, to exit the tunnel, if you will, and, and, and really excel in this new normal. Labor, I mean, man, we, we had a labor issue before the pandemic. Um, and even now with all the closures and there being less uh, need, if you will, in the restaurant industry, we still can't get it staffed. And so, you know, it's only a matter of time between, before you and I as consumers run out of patience going to a, a restaurant and and having four stations uh, serviced by only two wait staff. I mean, it's only a matter of time till we get back to that point where we're not as forgiving as we were during COVID. During COVID, if the food tasted good, 
uh, we liked it. If it was a little bit cold, we heated it up when we got it home. We were we were very forgiving, but yeah. that's going to change, I think, in the next three to six months. Mm -hmm. Talk about the changing back office model. What are you seeing happening there? It's a great question, and I think it, again, it depends on where 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 operators are in their in their journey, right? If they're still trying to keep the lights on and they're they're, they're really focused on on customer enhanced technologies and so forth, they're not even thinking about the back office yet. But at some point, they will if they haven't yet. Uh, labor shortages are not just in in the front of house. I mean, it's not just you know your clerks at your at your retail store and your wait staff or your, even your kitchen staff. It's your it's your your professional staff, your your finance staff, your back office staff as well. So lots of lots of people are looking at different options. Some of them are augmenting staff. You know, in the accounting field or the finance field, we had really complex uh, accounting coming at us in this past eighteen months, and with the new leasing standard coming down the pipe, um, augmenting their staff with people that are, are specialists in that area. Um, it, others are, are outsourcing that, that, that finance function entirely, and then some are doing a bit of a hybrid. They're using outside resources, but they're also adding technology and automating that finance function to make it more streamlined and more efficient. Mm -hmm. What about physical layouts? Are we, are we seeing that change because the dining rooms have been closed? Yeah, we are, and we should see more of it candidly. I, I do think that, I think when we think about it, even pre, pre-pandemic, um, I, I think all of us have walked into the restaurant where there are bags piled up off to the side of the podium waiting for DoorDash or whatever the delivery um, platform is that that particular restaurant tour was using. Um, and it, it made it very difficult and it was very congested. I think during the pandemic, uh, we were the restaurant operators in particular got very comfortable with takeout. Many of them, anyway, got comfortable with takeout and delivery and staging it and, and making it work. But once the dining rooms open again, and all of a sudden, you know, the kitchen has to accommodate on premise and that rise in off premise, and you get that congestion at the podium with bag stacking. I, I think I think that we're going to see more more a change in physical layout, particularly in the fast casual and casual space. QSR has it, has it, it's going on pretty well for them right now, but but having designated space uh, for carry out and, and delivery, and even having having the kitchens better designed to be able to deal with that that jump uh, during those day parts where both on-prem and off-prem are, really, uh, are really, really going at it at the same time, it's gonna be critically important to keep guests happy. Right, right. Well, how about, let's switch topics a little bit. How about um, M&A? What are we seeing there? It's picking up a little bit. Well, yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because M&A overall um, has opened up very, very, very quickly. Our transaction advisory team has been busy uh, for quite a while now. Uh, but most of that initial activity was in industries uh, that were helping us keep the lights on, technology companies in particular. Uh, but now we're seeing more consumer businesses starting to come back. The interest is is, is starting to pick up. Um, we're seeing a lot more interest in the restaurant space uh, because closures have created a lot of white space for growth. I mean, we've even seen private equity groups start restaurant-specific funds, uh, which is very encouraging to me. I mean, that demonstrates to me that that the investment community is recognizing the fact that there is more opportunity to grow with the closures that we've experienced over the past 18 months. There's some mm -hmm. second generation real estate that's available that may make that expansion a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit easier, a little more cost effective. Um, but there are still some unknowns in that area, so it will ramp up. But once it ramps up, I think it will take off. We just need to get a little bit further down the path, I think, for people to get done. You know, when some of these folks get some of that growth capital. You were telling me the other day that it's going to be, you know, there's going to be decisions that they have to make about where to grow. And talk a little bit about that, what, what the issues will be there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, my biggest, the biggest unknown for me personally is what happens in the big cities. Mm -hmm. So take New York, Chicago, Dallas, Boston, well, well, maybe not so much Dallas, but certainly Boston, those cities, that have financial centers. Um, what happens there, right? I mean, it, you know, if the big, if big, if big, if, if the big companies that have thousands of employees allow their employees to still work from home, 
what does that lunch business look like in in lower manhattan you know do do those restaurants come back to where they are so when 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 we get questions like that you know and i and i've had a lot of them lately look i want to go into chicago i want to go into into new york should i do an inside out or outside in um, you know, kind of plan, meaning do I start in the city and go out to the burbs or start at the burbs and then work my way in? I, I mean, it's, I don't have a crystal ball. I really don't know the answer to that, but I think that's one of the, one of the things that is really going to be, um, be, be, be critical in figuring out uh, the growth strategy because if, if the cities to come back for the restaurant industry, um, certainly that lunchtime crowd, it needs to be people there. And I'm not sure just yet what that all means for them. I mean, what it means in the cost model, right? I mean, if you think about it, okay, maybe the revenue comes down. And that's okay if the cost structure comes down. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but minimum wage isn't going down. So the cost of labor isn't going to go down in those cities. And then the question is, can the landlords afford to be able to cut the rents to make it balance out? And, and, and you just don't know at this point. Right. Now, in addition to consulting, you have a robust accounting practice for the franchise sector as well. Can you give me an update on some of the issues there? Yeah, sure. I mean, certainly on the tax side, you know, tax reform, um, all types of liquidity, liquidity um, questions are coming about with credits and incentives, uh, tangible property services around cost segregation and depreciation work opportunity tax credits. So on the, on, the, on the tax side, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of questions being asked. On the accounting side, you know, a lot of companies are still struggling with the accounting around these government programs and how do I deal with them? And how do I deal with debt modifications? How do I deal with lease modifications? And speaking of leasings, we've got the leasing standard that is finally be, gonna become due in the next 18 months. And and, 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 and a lot of companies are simply not prepared to deal with it. I mean, my advice to anybody who's operating more than 25 units uh, and has more than 25 leases, don't go it alone. Your, your staff is probably already overwhelmed with all of the change as a result of COVID. And um, trying to ask them to go through that process on their own is, is pretty challenging. So think about technology solutions, think about getting help um, and think broadly about getting help. We talked about outsourcing a little bit earlier on. Um, you know, that's a very real uh, opportunity for people to, to make things a little bit easier on themselves within their organization and allow them to focus on uh, what's really important, which is operating the business. Great. Thank you. Well, we're running out of time here. This was a lot of great information, John. Thank you so much for being here, uh, giving us both your time and expertise, and we really appreciate it. And thanks to RSM for sponsoring today. And for our attendees, stay tuned. We will be starting our first primetime session momentarily.